Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me, and, and thank you to the, the birthday men for having their birthdays. Um, I'm afraid that I'm not going to talk about anything that's very closely related to any of them, but uh, I wanted to talk, this is really a, much of a survey talk. Some of it is about some very old stuff. Um, and it includes some results of uh, a couple of my students of recent years. So graphs and reconstruction in, in polytopes. So the general question is, uh, how much combinatorial information do you need to determine the whole fa face lattice of a convex polytope? So uh, one answer is that uh, very little, in the sense that if you just knew uh, the list of facets and the vertices that each included, then of course you could determine the whole face lattice by, just by intersecting the facets. Um, but usually when this question is asked, we're looking for information from the bottom up. If you have a, a low part of the face lattice, then can you construct the re rest of the face lattice? Uh, so um, from that point of view, uh, the answer is you need quite a lot of information because, for example, if you take uh, a k that's less than d over 2 or less than d minus 1 over 2 and uh, you take the k skeleton of a d simplex, that is also the k skeleton of lots of other polytopes, namely the cyclic polytopes that have a dimension less than, than d. So the cyclic polytopes with d plus 1 vertices, um, they're uh, their, well, for example, their graph will be the complete graph, the graph of the simplex, and, and their k-skeleton will be the, the k-skeleton of the deep simplex. So uh, just some definitions. First of all, since we have, have people here who talk about different kinds of polytopes, all of these polytopes in the talk are real and convex. Oops. Um, so the case skeleton is, I'm, I'm, I'm a combinatorialist, so everything is combinatorial here. Uh, by the case skeleton, I just mean the, the sub poset of the face lattice of P consisting of all the faces of dimension at most K. And we say that two polytopes are K equivalent if their K skeletons are isomorphic. Oops. So, um, so as in the example of cyclic polytopes, a K-skeleton does not even determine the dimension of the polytope in general. But uh, if, you, if you take the K-skeleton, a K a little bit larger, then we do get the dimension. So uh, if P and Q are K-equivalent, and if you know the dimension of P is D, and that K is greater than or equal to D over 2, then Q also has to have dimension D. Not necessarily combinatorially equivalent to P, but at least of the same dimension. So in much of this talk, we're going to be restricting ourselves to comparing polytopes of the same dimension. Uh, OK, now, now one of the examples that uh, you know, I first learned and that is useful to keep in mind is that uh, with four dimensions, a four-dimensional polytope, so um, well, if, if, the K, if you're talking about a K skeleton of dimension 2 or higher, then one thing happens. But if you look at just the one skeleton, uh, that certainly does not uh, determine the combinatorial type of the polytope because, uh, for example, if you take the one skeleton to be the complete graph, then uh, we've got the cyclic 4 polytope with eight vertices, but there exists a different neighborly four polytope with eight vertices. It's not combinatorially equivalent. So neighborly here means, for, for four-dimensional polytopes, it means having the graph of the polytope, the, the set of vertices and edges being the complete graph. So some, uh, some more general results. Um, so. By the way, the, the D minus 1 skeleton of the polytope is, of course, all the information of the polytope. That tells you the facets, and so that tells you everything. Um, but Perot showed that you, you don't need quite that much information in general, that the D minus 2, if you have D minus 2 equivalent D polytopes, then they are combinatorially equivalent. 
So another way to say that is the D minus two skeleton of a D polytope determines the combinatorial type of the polytope. When I use that phrase, I'm going to assume we're talking about polytopes of the same dimension. Of course, <laughs> one example of this was known long before that uh, as a consequence of Steinitz's work that the graph of a three polytope determines the face lattice, as we all know. Now, if you restrict to various classes of polytopes, you, you may do better. So um, another result of parallax is that if P is a simplicial D polytope and Q is a simplicial polytope that has the same D over two skeleton, that's D over two equivalent to P, then Q does have to have the same dimension and um, P and Q are combinatorially equivalent. So I'm going to talk a bit about simple polytopes. I'm sure um, uh, many people here, here know the a big result about simple polytopes in this vein. Uh, so by simple, I mean every vertex is on exactly D edges. And those are the duals of simplicial polytopes. So the big theorem proved originally by Blint and Mani, um, and a different proof shortly thereafter by Gil Kalai says that the graph of a simple D polytope determines the whole face lattice of the polytope. Again, this is assuming you're talking about fixing the dimension D. It, is, uh, it, it doesn't exclude polytopes of lower dimension with the same graph. So, Kawai's proof is constructive. Uh, essentially, however, has to look at all acyclic orientations of the graph. And so it's not exactly a practical algorithm for constructing the whole face lattice. Uh, the construction is exponential in the number of vertices. Uh, a later proof um, by Friedman showed a well, a polynomial time algorithm, um, and it's based on work of Yossig, Keibel, and Kerner. Um, what it means to be a polynomial time algorithm is not so clear because the information that you're trying to create will be exponential in the number of vertices. Uh, here's a, a quote from, from the, his paper. We note that the face lattice may contain exponentially many faces, so exhibiting it explicitly may require exponential time. However, one can implicitly compute the face lattice in polynomial time. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but. So um, my student, Joseph Doolittle, has been looking at the issue of extending at least a little bit the, the simple polytope um, result. If you just look at having, having a small number of vertices that are not simple. So by non-simple vertex, I just mean its degree is greater than D. Uh, it turns out that uh, he was able to prove some results and then very soon found out that other people had done exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. So this is uh, independently done by Doolittle and by Nievo, Pineda, Vila, Vicencio, Ugan, and Yost. Um, they're now in the process of combining their papers. So um, hopefully we'll see, see that soon. So the result is that if G is the graph of a D polytope P in which at most two, uh, whoops, having at most two non-simple vertices, then G determines the whole face lattice of P. So um, let me give you a little bit of an idea of the uh, the, the simplest part of this proof, which is just if there's a single non-simple vertex, then it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so, um, well, I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, so, if, if there's just one vertex of degree greater than D in the polytope, then it's pretty easy just from the graph to determine the two-dimensional faces that contain that non-simple vertex V. And then you can also get the graph of P truncated at V. So, of course, I mean, this is, we don't really want to do this for, uh, need to do any of this for three-dimensional polytopes, but here's a picture of a part of 
the graph of a three-dimensional polytope to illustrate the point. This has one uh, non-simple vertex here, uh, degree four. Uh, truncating the polytope at that vertex means just taking a hyperplane that cuts, that separates the, that one vertex from the other vertices of the polytope. So the truncation is the intersection of that polytope with the half space determined by that uh, hyperplane. So it's, it's just cutting off that one vertex. And when you do that, if there's just this one non-simple vertex, the result is a simple polytope. So for the simple polytope, the truncated thing, you can use the theorem to uh, reconstruct that. That is to get all the, the whole face lattice of the truncated polytope. And then you also can um, identify what is the, the graph that has been created by that truncation, sorry, the facet, the graph of the facet that has been created by that truncation and uh, to then splice them back together in some way so that you can get the, the whole face lattice of the polytope P. Uh, the theorem also extends to having at most two non-simple vertices and uh, uh, it's certainly somewhat more complicated to, to take care of the two vertex case, um, but it follows pretty much the same, same uh, style. You have to consider different cases, whether the two non-simple vertices are adjacent or not. Um, but going up to three vertices, three non-simple vertices, uh, we, we cannot extend the theorem. Um, it's uh, not hard to, to come up with two combinatorially different four polytopes that have the same graph. Um, and in the graph, there are three non-simple vertices. And once you have that, uh, you can boost it up to higher dimensions. So in general, for uh, dimension D, greater than or equal to four, there are combinatorially different D polytopes with the same D minus three skeleton and D minus one non-simple vertices. Uh, Niemo, et cetera, uh, also showed that uh, if the graph of a D polytope has at most D minus two vertices of degree greater than D, then the two skeleton of P determines the whole face lattice of P. So I want to turn to a different, different topic. In that case, we were, we've been looking at polytopes that were all of the same dimension. Yeah, there will be some open questions, yeah. So um, the, uh, excuse me. So, so the, another uh, topic here is to look at, at graphs, let's say, or K skeletons that represent polytopes of different dimensions. And uh, so I'm gonna be looking at the graph of the cross polytope in particular. So of course, the cross polytope is a generalization of the octahedron. So it's the complete, the graph of that is the complete n partite graph with two vertices in each part. So I mean, there, there's the octahedron, but um, the antipodes, of course, uh, are the only things that are not adjacent in the graph. Oops. So, whoops. Um, so, uh, if you if you look at the n cross polytope, then the if there's another n-dimensional polytope with the same graph, it is gonna be combinatorially equivalent to the N cross polytope. But in general, there are polytopes in other dimensions with the same graph. So the question there is, uh, for what dimensions D, is there a D polytope whose graph is the graph of the N cross polytope? Uh, so let me give you a little bit of, of background on, on theorems that are used in this question. So, um, of course, we know that the graph of every D polytope is, is D connected, 
And a sort of extension of that idea is that the graph of every deep holotope has the complete graph KD plus one as a minor. I mean, one way to say that is that there's a, a subgraph which is the complete graph of D plus one vertices, but it has edges subdivided by vertices. Um, well, Hadwiger's number can, name can come up in a, a lot of different contexts at this conference, of course, but one way is the Hadwiger number of a graph G is the largest H such that KH is a minor of G. So it's relevant in studying the graphs of cross polytopes to know what the Hadwiger number of the graph of the cross polytope is. And that was found in 1966 by Halling as uh, for an n-dimensional cross polytope, the graph has Hadwiger number three n over two. So that tells us that the, uh, the dimension of a polytope whose graph is the graph of the n cross polytope must be less than 3n over 2. Um, and we certainly know that the n polytope has that graph, the n cross polytope has that graph, and that's dimension n. So uh, a previous student of mine, William Esvencheed, uh has a construction to get a polytope of every dimension between n and 3n over 2. Uh, having the, the graph of the n cross polytope as its graph, so one equivalent to the n cross polytope. Uh, you can go down a little bit below that. Uh, I mean, you can ask, what about smaller dimensions? Are there smaller dimensions that have uh, a d polytope, one equivalent to the n cross polytope? Um, there's an example in Grunbaum's book of a d minus one dimensional sorry, n minus one dimensional um, polytope, which has the graph of uh, the n cross polytope. That is, his example is, is in four dimensions. You have a four polytope, which is one equivalent to the five dimensional cross polytope. So there's a graph of the five dimensional cross polytope. Once you have that, of course, you can just keep taking by pyramids and uh, getting higher dimensional. But the question of, can you go below um, n minus one. Are there polytopes of dimension less than n minus one um, that have the same graph as the cross polytope? Now, this is, is a very special case of a general question and a conjecture um, by Grunbaum is that if you have two polytopes of different dimensions that are k-equivalent, then is it always the case that for every dimension between those two dimensions, there exists a k-equivalent n polytope. And as far as I know, this is still, still wide open. Okay, so one of the things I've looked at in the past was um, to say, suppose we extend this, the class from not just polytopes to Eulerian posets. So an Eulerian poset is just a, a ranked partially ordered set where if you look at any interval in the post set, um, which of course will also be ranked, then Euler's formula works. So another way to say that there are going to be the same number of even rank and an odd rank elements in the interval. So you can ask, uh, maybe you, you start with the K skeleton of a, of a polytope and maybe it uniquely determines the polytope of that dimension, but is there an Eulerian poset, which is of the appropriate rank, uh, that has that same K skeleton? Now, one example I'm, I'm gonna give is, is a, a trivial example. Um, I didn't mention before, but of course we all know that uh, the zero skeleton of the simplex determines the whole face lattice of a simplex. <laughs> that is, uh, you know, every, every convex polytope, d-dimensional convex polytope that has d plus one vertices has to be a simplex. But not true of Eulerian posets. So you can have an Eulerian poset that is zero equivalent to the three simplex. It has the same number of vertices, um, but is definitely different from the three simplex. So uh, 
you know, what, what can you say? So it seems like we won't be able to say very much about Eulerian posets, um, but uh, I, I do have these results. Um, so suppose you, you take a, a ranked poset of rank D plus one, let's say, and let's call this Q. Um, let's write Q minus QR for the poset obtained by restricting Q to all ranks but R plus one. So we just remove a rank from the poset. So if you start with a D polytope and the dimension of D, uh, uh, the dimension D is at least three, and unfortunately there's always this, this shift between dimension and rank, uh, you take a rank D plus one Eulerian poset. If your polytope was simplicial, and the rank you remove is not the top one, not D minus one, um, and your uh, Eulerian poset agrees with the polytope, with the face lattice of the polytope, except in dimension R, then it actually has to agree in dimension R, and, and P and Q are going to be this, the equivalent. So here I'm, I'm uh, identifying the polytope P with its face lattice. The face lattice will be, com will be a isomorphic to the poset Q. Um, the dual of that, of course, is just that if P is simple, then, um, then removing anything but the zero uh, rank will give you uh, an isomorphic poset, and I think there's a typo here, so of course the intersection of these, if P is a simplex and you remove something in between, uh, then your Eulerian poset must actually be, just be the Boolean algebra, the face lattice of the simplex. Okay, I, I really uh, want to, um, I don't have a lot more to say, so I guess this went faster than uh, I expected, but um, I want to mention some other results on, on graphs of polytopes. So. What was used in, in some of this was the issue of, of complete subgraphs, or at least complete graphs as minors of the graphs of polytopes. Um, and I haven't seen in the literature much about the opposite question of independent sets of vertices, but again, my student William Esvensheed studied this question a bit. Um, so the question is, uh, given a dimension and given a number of vertices, what is the maximum size of an independent set of vertices in d-dimensional polytopes with n vertices? So I'll call this alpha of dn. Oops. Um, so he was able to get some bounds for this. Um, that alpha of dn is the upper bound is n minus d minus one and the lower bound is n minus d minus one minus the n minus d minus three over d. Um, if, uh, if d is three, then alpha of three n is exactly the floor function of two times n minus three over three. Mark. Yes? Sorry, I... Oh, I'm sorry, independent means um, you have a set of vertices, no two are connected by an edge uh, in the polytope. So for the, um, for the cross polytope, the largest independent set of vertices would be two, would be the, the um, antipodes. Um, so this says that if you fix the dimension and the number of vertices, you can, for example, in dimension three, you can create a polytope such that there's some set of two times n minus three over three vertices, such that there are no, no two of those vertices is connected by an edge. Okay, well, let me just mention some open questions about the various things I've talked about. Uh, so the, the, the group that's been working on the extending the blint money and Kali result to non-simple vertices is looking at 
When we have three or more non-simple vertices, we know there are examples where that does not determine the combinatorial type of the polytope, but are there conditions that you can put on the three non-simple vertices, conditions related perhaps to adjacency or distance apart, whether they're, um, uh, the vertices are on common facets or not, that will allow this reconstruction um, with a fixed number of uh, non-simple vertices. Uh, I mentioned already Grunbaum's conjecture on intervals of dimensions of K equivalent polytopes, meaning you know, the conjecture was if you had two dimensions uh, that realized the K skeleton, the same K skeleton of a polytope, uh, could it always be realized by intermediate dimensions? Um, are there polytopes that are uh, uh, and this would be of dimension lower than D, that have the graph of a D cube. So one equivalent to the D cube. And then the last thing I talked about was uh, sort of reconstruction within the class of Eulerian post sets. And uh, you know, that, that's not so good, but uh, one of the main differences between polytopes and the general class of Eulerian post sets is that the face post sets of polytopes are lattices. And so the question of if I restrict myself not to the general class of Eulerian post sets, but to those which are actually lattices, um, can I get stronger reconstruction results um, between polytopes and, and Eulerian lattices? So. Um, that's it. Thank you.